Book Two of the Shadow and Bone Trilogy by Leigh Bardugo, Siege and Storm. Chapter 10. We didn't leave Rosalta right away, but spent the next three days transporting shipments of goods across the fold. We operated out of what was left of the military encampment at Kerbersk. Most of the troops had been pulled back when the fold started expanding. A new watchtower had been erected to monitor the black shores of the Unsea, and only a skeleton crew stayed on to operate the dry docks. Not a single Grisha remained at the encampment. After the Darklings' attempted coup and the destruction of Nova Kerbersk, a wave of anti-Grisha sentiment had swept through Ravka in the ranks of the First Army. I wasn't surprised. An entire town was gone, its people food for monsters. Ravka wouldn't soon forget. Neither could I. Some Grisha had fled to Azalta to seek the protection of the king. Others had gone into hiding. Nikolai suspected that most of them had sought out the Darkling and defected to his side. But with the help of Nikolai's rogue squalors, we managed two trips across the fold on the first day, three on the second, and four on the last. Sanskiv's journey to West Ravka empty and returned with huge cargoes of Zemini rifles, crates full of ammunition, parts for repeating guns similar to those Nikolai had used aboard the Hummingbird, and a few tons of sugar and jerda, all courtesy of Sturmhan's smuggling. Bribes, Mal said as we watched giddy soldiers tear into a shipment being unloaded on the dock, hooting and marveling over the glittering array of weaponry. Gifts, Nikolai corrected. You'll find the bullets work, regardless of my motives. He turned to me. I think we can fit in one more trip today. Game? I wasn't, but I nodded. He smiled and clapped me on the back. I'll give the orders. I could feel Mal watching me as I turned to look into the shifting darkness of the fold. There hadn't been a recurrence of the incident aboard the Hummingbird. Whatever I'd seen that day, vision, hallucination, I couldn't name it. It hadn't happened again. Still, I spent each moment on the unsee alert and wary, trying to hide just how frightened I really was. Nikolai wanted to use the crossings to hunt Volkra, but I refused. I told him that I still felt weak and that I wasn't sure enough about my power to guarantee our safety. My fear was real, but the rest was a lie. My power was stronger than ever. It flowed from me in pure and vibrant waves, radiant with the strength of the stag and the scales. But I couldn't bear the thought of hearing those screams again. I kept the light in a wide, glowing dome around the skiffs, and though the Volkers shrieked and beat their wings, they kept their distance. Mal accompanied us on all the crossings, staying close by my side, rifle at the ready. I knew he sensed my anxiousness, but he didn't press me for an explanation. In fact, he hadn't said much at all since our argument in the tent. I was afraid that when he did start talking, I wouldn't like what he had to say. I hadn't changed my mind about returning to Azalta, but I was worried that he might. The morning we decamped for the capital, I searched the crowd for him, terrified he might just decide not to show up. I said a little prayer of thanks when I glimpsed him, straight-backed and silent in his saddle, waiting to join the column of riders. We set out before dawn, a twisting procession of horses and wagons that winded its way out of camp on the broad road known as the Vi. Nikolai had obtained a plain blue kefta for me, but it was tucked away in the luggage. Until he had more of his own men in place to guard me, I was just another soldier in the prince's retinue. As the sun crested the horizon, I felt a small flutter of hope. The idea of trying to take the Darkling's place, of attempting to reassemble the Grisha and command the Second Army, still felt impossibly daunting. But at least I was doing something instead of just fleeing from the Darkling or waiting for him to snatch me up. I had two of Morozova's amplifiers, and I was headed to a place where I might find answers that would lead me to the third. Mal was unhappy, but watching the morning light break over the treetops, I felt sure I could bring him around. My mood didn't survive the journey through Kabursk. We'd passed through the ramshackled port town after the crash on the lake, but I'd been too shaken and distracted to really take note of the way the place had changed. This time, it was unavoidable. Though Kabursk had never had much beauty to recommend it, its sidewalks had teamed with travelers and merchants, kingsmen and dock workers. Its bustling streets had been lined with busy stores ready to outfit expeditions into the fold, along with bars and brothels that catered to the soldiers at the encampment. But those streets were quiet and nearly empty. Most of the inns and shops had been boarded up. The real revelation came when we reached the church. I remembered it as a tidy building capped by bright blue domes. Now the whitewashed walls were covered in writing, row after row of names written in red paint that had dried to the color of blood. The steps were littered with heaps of withered flowers, small painted icons, the melted stubs of prayer candles. I saw bottles of kvass, piles of candy, the abandoned body of a child's doll. Gifts for the dead. I scanned the names. Stepan Rushkin, 57. Anya Serenka, 13. Michael Lasky, 45. Rebecca Lasky, 44. Peter Ozerov, 22. Marina Koska, 19. Valentin Yomki, 72. Sasha Penkin, 8 months. They went on and on. My fingers tightened on the reins as a cold fist closed over my heart. Memories came back to me unbidden. A mother running with a child in her arms. A man stumbling as the darkness caught him, his mouth open in a scream. An old woman, confused and frightened, swallowed by the panic crowd. I'd seen it all. I'd made it possible.
Those are the people of Nova Kabursk, the city that had once stood directly across from Kabursk on the other side of the fold. A sister city full of relatives, friends, business partners. People who had worked the docks and manned the skiffs, some who must have survived multiple crossings. They lived on the edge of horror, thinking they were safe in their own homes, walking the streets of their little port town. And now they were all gone because I'd failed to stop the Darkling. Mal brought his horse up beside mine. Alina, he said softly, come away. I shook my head. I wanted to remember. Tasha Stoll, Andre Bazin, Shura Raichenko. As many as I could. They'd been murdered by the Darkling. Did they haunt his sleep the way they haunted mine? We have to stop him, Mal, I said hoarsely. We have to find a way. I don't know what I hoped he would say, but he remained silent. I wasn't sure Mal wanted to make me any more promises. Eventually, he rode on, but I forced myself to read every single name, and only then did I turn to go, guiding my horse back into the deserted street. A bit of life seemed to return to Kerbersk as we moved farther away from the fold. A few shops were open, and there were still merchants hawking their wares on the stretch of the vi known as Peddler's Way. Riggedy tables lined the road, their surfaces covered in brightly colored cloth and spread with a jumble of merchandise. Boots and prayer shawls, wooden toys, shoddy knives, and hand-told sheaves. Many of the tables were littered with what looked like bits of rock and chicken bones. Provinia Osti, the peddler shouted. Ochinia Osti, real bone, genuine bone. As I leaned over my horse's head to get a better look, an old man called out, Alina! I looked up in surprise. Did he know me? Nikolai was suddenly beside me. He nudged his horse close to mine and snatched my reins, giving them a hard yank to draw me away from the table. Net, spasibo, he said to the old man. Alina, the peddler cried. Ochinia Alina! Wait, I said, twisting in my saddle, trying to get a better look at the old man's face. He was tidying the display on his table. Without the possibility of a sale, he seemed to have lost all interest in us. Wait, I insisted. He knew me. No, he didn't. He knew my name, I said, angrily grabbing the reins back from him. He was trying to sell you relics, finger bones, genuine Sancta Alina. I froze, a deep chill stealing over me. My oblivious horse kept steadily on. Genuine Alina? I repeated numbly. Nikolai shifted uneasily. There are rumors that you died on the fold. People have been selling off parts of you all over Ravka and West Ravka for months. You're quite the good luck charm. Those are supposed to be my fingers? Knuckles, toes, fragments of rib. I felt sick. I looked around, hoping to spot Mal, needing to see something familiar. Of course, Nikolai continued, if half of those really were your toes, you'd have about a hundred feet. But superstition is a powerful thing. So is faith, said a voice behind me, and when I turned, I was surprised to see Toya there, mounted on a huge black warhorse, his broad face solemn. It was all too much. The optimism I'd felt only an hour ago had vanished. It suddenly seemed as if the sky were pressing down on me, closing in like a trap. I kicked my horse into a canter. I'd always been a clumsy rider, but I held on tight and did not stop until Kerbersk was far behind me and I no longer heard the rattling of bones. That night we stayed at an inn in the little village of Vernost, where we met up with a heavily armed group of soldiers from the 1st Army. I soon learned that many of them were from the 22nd, the regiment Nikolai had served with and eventually helped lead in the Northern Campaign. Apparently, the prince wanted to be surrounded by friends when he entered Azalta. I couldn't blame him. He seemed to relax in their presence and, once again, I noticed his demeanor change. He transitioned effortlessly from the role of glib adventurer to arrogant prince, and now he became a beloved commander, a soldier who laughed easily with his companions and knew each commoner's name. The soldiers had a lavish coach and tow. It was lacquered in pale rock and blue and emblazoned with the king's double eagle on one side. Nikolai had ordered a golden sunburst added to the other, and it was drawn by a matched team of six white horses. As the glittering contraption rumbled into the inn's courtyard, I had to roll my eyes, remembering the excesses of the Grand Palace. Maybe bad taste was inherited. I had hoped to eat dinner alone with Mal in my room, but Nikolai had insisted that we all dine together in the inn's common room. So instead of relaxing by the fire in peace, we were jammed elbow to elbow at a noisy table packed with officers. Mal hadn't said a word throughout the entire meal, but Nikolai talked enough for all three of us. As he dug into a dish of braised oxtail, he ran through a seemingly endless list of places he intended to stop on the way to Azalta. Just listening to him wore me out. I didn't realize winning the people meant meeting every single one of them, I grumbled. Aren't we in a hurry? Ravka needs to know its Sun Summoner has returned. And its wayward prince? Him too. Gossip will do more than royal pronouncements. And that reminds me, he said, lowering his voice. From here on out, you need to behave as if someone is watching every minute. He gestured between me and Mal with his fork. What you do in private is your own affair. Just be discreet. I nearly choked on my wine. What? I sputtered. It's one thing for you to be linked with a royal prince, quite another for people to think you're tumbling a peasant. I'm not. It's nobody's business, I whispered furiously. I darted a glance at Mal. His teeth were clenched and he was gripping his knife a little too tightly. 
Power is alliance, said Nikolai. It's everyone's business. He took another sip of wine and I glared at him in disbelief. And you should be wearing your own colors. I shook my head, thrown by the change of subject. Now you're choosing my clothes? I was wearing the blue kefta, but clearly Nikolai wasn't satisfied. If you intend to lead the second army and take the Darkling's place, then you need to look the part. Summoners wear blue, I said irritably. Don't underestimate the power of the grand gesture, Alina. The people like spectacle. The Darkling understood that. I'll think about it. Might I suggest gold, Nikolai went on? Very regal. Very appropriate. Very tacky. Gold and black would be best. Perfect symbolism and... No black, Mal said. He pushed back from the table and, without another word, disappeared into the crowded room. I set down my fork. I can't tell if you're deliberately making trouble or if you're just an ass. The prince took another bite of his dinner. He doesn't like black? It's the color of the man who tried to kill him and regularly takes me hostage. My sworn enemy? All the more reason to claim that color as your own. I craned my neck to see where Mal had gone. Through the doorway, I watched him take a seat by himself at the bar. No, I said. No black. As you like, Nikolai replied. But choose something for yourself and your guards. I sighed. Do I really need guards? Nikolai leaned back in his chair and studied me, his face suddenly serious. Do you know how I got the name Sturmhond? he asked. I thought it was some kind of joke, a play on Sabachka. No, he said. It's a name I earned. The first enemy ship I ever boarded was a feared and traitor out of your home. When I told the captain to lay down his sword, he laughed in my face and told me to run home to my mother. He said feared and men make bread from the bones of skinny Rothkin boys. So you killed him? No. I told him foolish old captains weren't fit meat for Rothkin men. Then I cut off his fingers and fed them to my dog while he watched. You what? The room was packed with rowdy soldiers singing, shouting, telling stories, but it all fell away as I stared at Nikolai in stunned silence. It was as if I was watching him transform again, as if the charming mask had shifted to reveal a very dangerous man. You heard me. My enemies understood brutality. And so did my crew. After it was over, I drank with my men and divvied up the spoils. Then I went back to my cabin, vomited up the very fine dinner my steward had prepared, and cried myself to sleep. But that was the day I became a real privateer, and that was the day Sturmhan was born. So much for puppy, I said, feeling a bit nauseated myself. I was a boy trying to lead an undisciplined crew of thieves and rogues against enemies who were older, wiser, and tougher. I needed them to fear me, all of them. And if they hadn't, more people would have died. I pushed my plate away. Just whose fingers are you telling me to cut off? I'm telling you that if you want to be a leader, it's time you started thinking and acting like one. I've heard this before, you know, from the Darkling and his supporters. Be brutal, be cruel. More lives will be saved in the long run. Do you think I'm like the Darkling? I studied him. The golden hair, the sharp uniform, those two clever hazel eyes. No, I said slowly. I don't think you are. I rose to go join Mal. But I've been wrong before. The journey to Azalta was less a march than a slow, excruciating parade. We stopped at every town along the Vi, at farms, schools, churches, and dairies. We greeted local dignitaries and walked the wards of hospitals. We dined with war veterans and applauded girls' choirs. It was not hard to notice that the villages were mostly populated by the very young and the very old. Every able body had been drafted to serve in the king's army and fight in Ravka's endless wars. The cemeteries were as big as the towns. Nikolai handed out gold coins and sacks of sugar. He accepted handshakes from merchants and kisses on the cheek from wrinkled matrons who called them Sabachka, and charmed anyone who came within two feet of him. He never seemed to tire and never seemed to flag. No matter how many miles we'd ridden or people we'd met, he was ready to meet another. He always seemed to know what people wanted from him, when to be the laughing boy, the golden prince, the weary soldier. I supposed it was the train that came with being born a royal and raised at court, but it was still unnerving to watch. He hadn't been kidding about spectacle. He always tried to time our arrivals at dawn or dusk, or he'd stop our procession in the deep shadows of a church or town square, all the better to show off the sun summoner. When he caught me rolling my eyes, he just winked and said, Everyone thinks you're dead, lovely. It's important to make a good showing. So I held up my end of the bargain and acted my part. I smiled graciously and called the light to shine over rooftops and steeples and bathe every awestruck face in warmth. People wept. Mothers brought me their babies to kiss, and old men bowed over my hand, their cheeks damp with tears. I felt like a complete fraud, and I said as much to Nikolai. What do you mean, he asked, genuinely puzzled. The people love you. You mean they love your prize goat, I grumbled as we rode out of one town. Have you actually won any prizes? This isn't funny, I whispered angrily. You've seen what the Darkling can do. These people will be sending their sons and daughters off to fight Nichevoya, and I won't be able to save them. You're feeding them a lie. We're giving them hope. That's better than nothing. Spoken like a man who's never had nothing, I said, and wheeled my horse away.
Ravka in summer was at its most lovely, its fields thick with gold and green, the air balmy and sweet with the scent of warm hay. Despite Nikolai's protests, I insisted on forgoing the comforts of the coach. My bottom was sore and my thighs complained loudly when I eased from the saddle every night, but sitting my own horse meant fresh air and the chance to seek out Mal on each day's ride. He didn't talk much, but he seemed to be thawing a bit. Nikolai had circulated the story of how the Darkling had tried to execute Mal on the fold. It had earned Mal instant trust among the soldiers, even a small measure of celebrity. Occasionally, he scattered with the trackers in the unit, and he was trying to teach Toya how to hunt, though the big Grisha wasn't much for stalking silently through the woods. On the road out of Sala, we were passing through a strand of white elms when Mal cleared his throat and said, I was thinking. I sat up straight and gave him my full attention. It was the first time he'd initiated a conversation since we left Kerbersk. He shifted in his saddle, not meeting my eye. I was thinking of who we could get to round out the guard. I frowned. The guard? He cleared his throat. For you. A few of Nikolai's men seem all right, and I think Toya and Tamar should be considered. They're Shu, but they're Grisha, so it shouldn't be a problem. And there's, well, me. I didn't think I'd ever actually seen Mal blush. I grinned. Are you saying you want to be captain of my personal guard? Mal glanced at me, his lips quirking in a smile. Do I get to wear a fancy hat? The fanciest, I said, and possibly a cape. Will there be plumes? Oh yes, several. Then I'm in. I wanted to leave it at that, but I couldn't seem to help myself. I thought, I thought you might want to go back to your unit, to be a tracker again. Mal studied the knot in his reins. I can't go back. Hopefully, Nikolai can keep me from being hanged. Hopefully, I squeaked. I deserted my post, Alina. Not even the king can make me a tracker again. Mal's voice was steady, untroubled. He adapts, I thought. But I knew some part of him would always grieve for the life he'd been meant to have. The life he would have had without me. He nodded up ahead to where Nikolai's back was barely visible in the column of riders. And there's no way I'm leaving you alone with Prince Perfect. So you don't trust me to resist his charms? I don't even trust myself. I've never seen anyone work a crowd the way he does. I'm pretty sure the rocks and trees are getting ready to swear fealty to him. I laughed and leaned back, felt the sun warming my skin through the dappled shade of the tree boughs overhead. I touched my fingers to the sea whip's fetter, safely hidden by my sleeve. For now, I wanted to keep the second amplifier a secret. Nikolai's Grisha had been sworn to silence, and I could only hope they'd hold their tongues. My thoughts strayed to the firebird. Some part of me still couldn't quite believe it was real. Would it look the way it had in the pages of the red book? its feathers rotten white and gold? Or would its wings be tipped with fire? And what kind of monster would knock an arrow and bring it down? I had refused to take the stag's life, and countless people had died because of it. The citizens of Nova Kerbersk, the Grisha and the soldiers I'd abandoned on the Darkling Skiff. I thought of those high church walls covered in the names of the dead. Morozova's stag, Rusalai, the firebird. Legends come to life before my eyes just to die in front of me. I remembered the sea whip's heaving sides, the thready whistle of its last breaths. It had been on the brink of death and still I'd hesitated. I don't want to be a killer, but mercy might not be a gift the Sun Summoner could afford. I gave myself a shake. First we had to find the Firebird. Until then, all our hopes rested on the shoulders of one untrustworthy prince. The next day, the first pilgrims appeared. They looked like any other townspeople, waiting by the road to see the royal procession roll past, but they wore armbands and carried banners emblazoned with a rising sun. Dirty from long days of travel, they hefted satchels and sacks stuffed with their few belongings, and when they caught sight of me in my blue kefta, the stag's collar around my neck, they swarmed around my horse, murmuring sancta, sancta, and trying to grab my sleeve or my hem. Sometimes they fell to their knees, and I had to be careful or risk my horse trampling one of them. I thought I'd grown used to all the attention, even being pawed at by strangers, but this felt different. I didn't like being called saint, and there was something hungry in their faces that set my nerves on edge. As we pushed deeper into Ravka's interior, the crowds grew. They came from every direction, from cities, towns, and ports. They clustered in village squares and by the side of the Vi, men and women, old and young, some on foot, some astride donkeys, or crowded into hay carts. Wherever we went, they cried out to me. Sometimes I was Sancta Alina, sometimes Alina the Just, or the Bright, or the Merciful. Daughter of Karamzin, they shouted, Daughter of Ravka. Daughter of the Fold. Ribe de Vastolba, they called me. Daughter of Two Mills, after the valley that was home to the nameless settlement of my birth. I had the vaguest memory of the ruins the valley was named after, two rocky spindles by the side of a dusty road. The apparat had been busy breaking open my past, sifting through the rubble to build the story of a saint. The pilgrims' expectations terrified me. As far as they were concerned, I'd come to liberate Ravka from its enemies, from the shadow fold, from the darkling, from poverty, from hunger, from sore feet and mosquitoes, and anything else that might trouble them. They begged for me to bless them, to cure them, but I could only summon light, wave, and let them touch my hand. It was all part of Nikolai's show. The pilgrims had come not just to see me, but to follow me. 
They attached themselves to the royal processional, and their ragged band swelled with every passing day. They trailed us from town to town, camping in fallow fields, holding dawn vigils to pray for my safety and the salvation of Ravka. They were close to outnumbering Nikolai's soldiers. This is the operat's doing, I complained to Tamar one night at dinner. We were lodged at a roadhouse for the evening. Through the windows I could see the lights of the pilgrims' cookfires, hear them singing peasant songs. These people should be home, working their fields and caring for their children, not following some false saint. Tamar pushed a piece of overcooked potato around on her plate and said, My mother told me that Grisha power is a divine gift. And you believed her? I don't have a better explanation. I set my fork down. Tamar, we don't have a divine gift. Grisha power is just something you're born with, like having big feet or a good singing voice. That's what the shoe believed. That it's something physical, buried in your heart or your spleen, something that can be isolated and dissected. She glanced out the window to the pilgrim's camp. I don't think those people would agree. Please don't tell me you think I'm a saint. It doesn't matter what you are, it matters what you can do. Tamar, those people think you can save Ravka, she said. Obviously you do too, or you wouldn't be going to Azalta. I'm going to Azalta to rebuild the second army. And find the third amplifier? I nearly dropped my fork. Keep your voice down, I sputtered. We saw the Astori Sanctia. So Sturmon hadn't kept the book a secret. Who else knows, I asked, trying to regain my composure. We're not going to tell anyone, Alina. We know what's at risk. Tamara's glass had left a damp circle on the table. She traced it with her finger and said, You know, some people believe that all the first saints were Grisha. I frowned. Which people? Tamar shrugged. Enough that their leaders were excommunicated. Some were even burned at the stake. I've never heard that. It was a long time ago. I don't understand why that idea makes people so angry. Even if the saints were Grisha, that doesn't make what they did any less miraculous. I squirmed in my chair. I don't want to be a saint, Tamar. I'm not trying to save the world. I just want to find a way to defeat the Darkling. Rebuild the second army. Defeat the Darkling. Destroy the fold. Free Ravka. Call it what you like, but all that sounds suspiciously like saving the world. Well, when she put it that way, it did seem a little ambitious. I took a sip of wine. It was sour stuff compared with the vintages aboard the Volkvoni. Mal is going to ask you and Toya to be members of my personal guard. Tamar's face broke into a beautiful grin. Really? You're practically doing the job now anyway. But if you're going to be guarding me morning and night, you need to promise me something. Anything, she said, beaming. No more talk of saints.